Welcome to the museum at FIT's Fashion Culture Special Program Series. Tonight, it is our great honor to present fashion in the social media era. Eva Chen is the head of fashion partnerships for Instagram. Prior to Instagram, Eva was the editor-in-chief of Lucky, and she also has worked at Teen Vogue, Elle, and Vogue China. She graduated from John Hopkins University and received her master's degree from the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. Becca McCarran is the founder of architectural women's wear line Chromat. Chromat began in 2010, drawing from McCarran's background in architecture, and the brand was finalist for the CFDA Vogue Fashion Fund in 2015. And Tanya Taylor seeks to challenge women to confidently add color and print to their lives. The brand is designed in New York City and it embodies an artful uh, pursuit of individuality and optimism. Taylor studied finance at McGill University and later pursued fashion at the Parsons New School for Design. In 2012, Taylor launched her eponymous collection, which is sold in different um, stores around the world. Um, in 2015, Tanya became an official member of the CFDA and was awarded the USA Walmart Regional Prize, and in 2014, the Gold Coast Award. Please join me in welcoming Eva, Becca, and Tanya. Hi guys, thanks so much for coming. Hold on, I didn't realize there was gonna be water out here, so I like BYO 18 like, <laughs> bottles of beverages. I like to stay hydrated, so sorry. Um, thank you guys so much for coming, and thank you so much, Becca and Tanya, for being a part of this panel. Um, I didn't realize until like 10 minutes ago that I was moderating this panel, so this is like my dream in life to pretend I'm Oprah for, for the night. So you guys aren't gonna get cars. Like look under your seat, there's a free car for everyone. No, I'm kidding. Um, but thank you again for joining us and I hope that we can make this like a fun, informal panel. I know that they're gonna be passing around slips so people can a ask questions. So please write down your burning questions. You can ask me where I got my grandma sweater. You can ask like us the weirdest people we follow on Instagram. But why don't we start with that question actually? Let's have a little icebreaker. Like who is like the most unexpected person that you follow on Instagram? Um, I don't know. Who's yours? Um, my, mine is, um, there's an Instagram account called Jess Rona Grooming, J-E-S-S-R-O-N-A Grooming. It's a dog groomer in LA. Oh my God, I follow her oh too. Oh my God, she's so amazing. It's like the, she does the fan yeah. in the hair of the dogs. Yeah. And they, they're like this, like in yeah. front of the fan. It's like glamour, yeah, yeah, yeah. glamour shots of dogs where it's in slow motion. Oh my God. So yeah. she'll like have a poodle who has like an amazing bouffant like hairdo. And then they'll, she'll put like music and, and then like the hair is rippling and like they look sexier than Victoria's Secret models. Totally, It's like yeah. so good. So you guys all have to follow that account. Beyonce fan. Actually, I started following them recently because I feel like that's gonna be my second career, is dog grooming. Really? Oh. Yeah, I don't, I've never owned a pet, okay. but, um, <laughs> you might but I just recently got married. My wife is here in the audience and Yay. we've been talking about getting a dog. And the one I want is like a big standard poodle so I can like do the big like yes. topiary. Yes. So I started following her to try and like through osmosis get the skills I need. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so that, that <laughs> definitely, that's definitely one of the, the other account that you guys all have to follow is called Chili Philly. Um, C-H-I, I think it's two L's I and then Philly like the city. And he's this crochet artist in Melbourne cool. who literally like he's just, Go on your phone now and look him up. I highly suggest it. You will not regret it. He basically crochets like bacon and eggs onto his head. Like he'll yeah. crochet like literally like ketchup bottles. Um, and he makes it all himself just for like the art. So, okay, Tanya, you have to okay. share. Um, I follow a lot of weird ones, but um, one that I've like, I've never met this person, but I'm obsessed is one called Oretta. Oh. A-U-R-E-T-A. They do like, they take pictures of like outdoor scenes and then put like weird rainbow glows over them. And it's very beautiful, kind of like dreamy. If you're having a bad day, you kind of jump into their Instagram account. Um, but I like the dogs. I feel yeah, like I will definitely like, be into the dogs. Like, I'm a cat person. I will I remind you to <laughs> look up um, Just Run a Grooming after this. So like speaking of like just like, how has Instagram 
changed, you know, the way you guys work and how has it helped your careers, if at, if at all? I think that um, Instagram has definitely allowed us to connect our customer in a totally different way than we would have been able to without it. Um, for us, it's a lot about the story of each collection and I paint our prints, um, we all work in a small studio in Soho and being able to kind of have really personal storytelling behind either using Instagram stories or using imagery. Um, I think people have been able to connect with us more. They're like, okay, you know, when we say we paint prints, it's not that it's just something we're saying. They can actually see how it's being done and we can kind of inspire them to connect to the collection in a way that, you know, we wouldn't have been able to have a platform to do that otherwise. Um, I think also just directly talking to people and getting feedback. Like we have found so many cool collaborators on Instagram and we've built sets around our fashion show by someone we saw on Instagram. Yeah, you had one show, was it the rainbow kind yeah. of string? Can you tell the audience about yeah, that so a bit? Yeah, so there's this artist called Hot Tea, and I was going through my Instagram feed, and he does, he's a yarn artist, and yarn bombing was becoming this thing like a year ago. I had no idea the cool kids did, and um, he, I direct messaged him, and he lives in Minnesota, and he happened to be in New York, and he stopped by the studio, and he did an installation for us that was 62 feet by 40 feet, and it was one of the biggest installations he ever did, but it was this cool rainbow yarn installation that it, it totally just brought everything to life, and I think we've found illustrators, we've found incredible you know, um, models, different people to work with through Instagram, and it feels like it's kind of created a community where um, you've just been able to kind of connect in a different way. Yeah, I think for us, um, Instagram is by far our biggest platform of all our social media, and we definitely treat it um, in a way to tell, explain our collection, um, show everything from Fashion Week, uh, meet new people as well. But um, on the other side of like how it actually helps our business, by far we watch our traffic, and the most traffic comes from Instagram than any other platform. So. It's cool to see that people are actually shopping from our store, and we have a plugin called 460 where you can like, the link will go to a website where each Instagram picture is, and then you can click on that link to shop the actual look. So do, so do you see conversion, or do you see like things that you post on your Instagram getting more of an uptick, or in terms of sales or inquiries? Yeah, sometimes I think you know people have asked me that like if Beyonce when Beyonce wears something does that thing sell out? And for us, it's not. Yes. <laughs> Well, it's not like as direct as that. Uh, I think more the people who see Beyonce wearing chromat, they're inspired by who she is and what she represents as a strong, powerful woman, and that's what draws them to chromat. So mm -hmm. it's sort of a bigger picture of it doesn't directly translate, but it's sort of the whole aura. Speaking of Beyonce, I want to hear about some of your like inspirations, like for both of you in terms of your design and your design process. I know that you, it was mentioned that you studied art. And for those of you guys who don't follow Tanya, you have to, because she posts these amazing hyperlapses of like literally your prints being, I can't tell you how many other designers I've shown that to where it's like, I'm literally seeing, you know, your, your clothing come together. And Hermes recently posted for instance, not that they were like copying you or anything, God, <laughs> Hermes, uh, but like they started posting like kind of like how the silk screens come together and it's like I think being able to see the process yeah. has been really important. So I'd love to hear about how you choose to share your process through Instagram and is there anything that you ever hold back or like choose not to share? At this point I feel like our Instagram is so highly curated that I wish it was a little more messy. Like, I don't know. Do you use stories? I do, yeah, stories are, I show lots of pics of the studio and wherever we are, I story a lot. And that's, that's that more like uncut side of what we do, for sure. Mine's probably too messy. Um, I think <laughs> No, it's so good. Thank you, but I feel like I, I love being really personal with, with my Instagram and um, I use stories to be a bit more personal and then I use the actual Instagram page to show a lot about the collection, a lot about the studio, a lot about the people in the studio, I think that there's also something cool about empowering your team to be part of your Instagram messaging. Um, but yeah, I think the process is something that you never get to tell your customer. And I think using Instagram to show the paintings or show like I'm in a fabric meeting and I'm selecting wools for fall, like the timeline of how a customer understands you're building a collection is an interesting thing that I don't think, I think they have a lot of curiosity to understand more about. If you could give advice, I know there are a lot of um, aspiring designers in the audience and people just in general who want to break into fashion. What advice would you give um, 
let's just say like a 20 year old fashion student at FIT in terms of breaking into the industry period? Or like, is there any advice you would give yourself if you could go back in time five years from now? Well, for me, I didn't study fashion. So you guys are already way ahead of me in the timeline. Um, I learned how to do tech packs from my interns. So things like that are really important, like actual technical skills. What is a tech skills. pack? I should know Oh this, yeah, a tech pack oh, is basically a set of construction documents that you hand off to the factory. So it's like a blueprint. Yeah, exactly. I'm sure all of you guys knew that, but like I am very excited to learn something new. Yeah. So I'm going to casually drop it in conversation. So I'm like, <laughs> so is that the tech pack? And then people will be like, oh my God, she's so like knowledgeable. <laughs> exactly. So you learned from your intern. Yeah, but I would say for me, I'm, I feel lucky that I didn't study fashion because I came at it from a different way. I studied architecture. And so I look at the body as sort of a building site for interventions and structure. And um, I think that's also helped us navigate the world of fashion technology because that sort of bilingual experience of being able to understand the engineering side as well as the fashion side is how we've gotten ourselves into so many collaborations like with Intel. But I would say for advice to just not kind of go straight in and, and explore different non-fashion things because that will just enrich your experience and make you more unique. Yeah, um, I also didn't come from a fashion background. I studied finance originally, um, went to Parsons here, but tech packs are key. Um, I, I think that I didn't know, I, I knew nothing about how to build a company or how to work in New York or anything, and I just wasn't very, I was, uh, I was fearless at the time about asking for help, and when I have interns that are really active and alert and willing to, they're curious, like they, they want, to learn from you. I think those are the ones that we hire and they become part of the team. Um, but I think, yeah, I think it's definitely enriching yourself. I think that when someone's applying for a job, I like to know that they are doing a lot more than just coming to work and feeling like they're, you know, going to be your technical designer. Like, I want to know that they love cooking. I want to know that they have a personality. Do you, like, Instagram stalk them before you hire Totally. Them? Of course. So that's, like, a word of warning, not to be, like, <laughs> heavy-handed. That was, like, basically my segue into saying for the students in the room, I will Instagram stalk you. <laughs> no. <laughs> Keep that in mind. Maybe no, no keg stand photos. It just it shows a lot about their personality and their their tone of how they kind of live their life, and I think that's so important now is that everyone you're looking at that in a full 360 picture more than ever. Um, it, has there been a moment yet, or can you describe your first moment where you're like, "Wow, I think like because I, I, I imagine being a young designer, there probably there are many moments of struggle or kind of like self doubt, and I think that's something that people don't always realize because when you see the glot, like both of you guys going through the CFDA fashion fund and kind of being a part of that glittery process, like when was the first moment that you felt like, okay, I can do this, like this, I, I think I can make this work. And on the flip side, how can you talk about a struggle that you may have had and how you kind of worked your way out of that? I'll break it up into two questions. Let's start with like the struggle first, then we'll like go to the positive side. I think that there's a lot of struggle. Um, I, I think that we, we, in our second and third year, we grew quickly, and I didn't know what to do to keep that going in our fourth and fifth year. So we're in our fifth year right now, and it feels like the stores that you were growing with, how do you keep their business healthy? How, you know, those are things that um, I constantly struggle with. I think when it comes to social media, it's, a hard industry to be in when everything looks like the grass is greener and you know you're not at 10 parties every night and I think that's something I've really taken time this year to realize that I can only be so many places at once and it, it, it you know you it's always alluring to kind of feel like you've missed out but I think it's important as a designer to stay really strong and really confident and realize that you know, you're doing your best because I think we're both so young and we're trying to build these companies. Um, so I find it a struggle just not knowing how to lead and how to kind of keep growing. Yeah, I mean, if you really want to get into it, like I would say the most difficult part for running a small business is finances. Like the whole collection that you see on the runway, we have to pay for that upfront to design everything. Then we get orders, luckily, hopefully, and if the orders are big, then you have to come up with more money to like put all, buy all the fabric, put it into production, yeah. pay the factory, then you ship it to the store, 
And then in 30 days or 60 days, you finally, finally get paid for all of the work that you just did in the last six months. So it's, it's really scary. <laughs> it's like the, um, it's the ebb and flow of, of cash flow and like having employees and having to pay everyone constantly. Um, I don't know. That's totally no, a, <laughs> that's like not a cool thing to talk about in a struggle, but it's, it's so good that you're serious. talking about it though, because I do feel yeah, like yeah. so often in the media you hear stories such as like, oh my gosh, Pro ends a schooler, like their collection was bought right off like from Exactly. Like, yeah. you know, before they even graduated and instant Cinderella success story. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's almost even more important to be honest and upfront on social and on Instagram and talk about like the hard parts too because I think that sense of education is really important. I remember a piece of advice that, I don't remember where I read, it might have been Mark Jacobs who said one of the most important things in his development as a designer was working with Robert Duffy, yeah. who helped him understand the business aspect. And I think that when, I remember when I worked at Teen Vogue and I interviewed so many young designers, like they all said the same thing. They were like, I wish I had took, taken time to understand accounting more. Totally. And like accounts payable and those kind of skills because it's not just the creative. And yeah. I think when you're a young designer, you do feel sometimes a little bit powerless when you're working with bigger, you know, retailers and you work so hard and then that cash flow issue happens and at the end of the season, what they don't sell, they try to send back to you. And it's like, it's a really hard relationship to be in where you don't know what is right and what you should fight for. So I think, yeah, a business partner is definitely, if anyone has the opportunity to do that, is an amazing way to start. Yeah, and like I was, um when I first started out, I saw someone, another fashion designer, talking about this, and maybe you guys have heard this before, but, you know, running a company and being a designer, being the head of your own label, it's like, you think you're going to be in a room, like, painting and sketching and being super creative, but that's only, like, 10% of what you do, and the rest of it is all business stuff, figuring out where the factory is going to produce, how to get your fabric, like, how to show your collection to people, they're so, and, you know, figuring out what your Instagram posts are going to be, and just, like, planning your whole marketing, it's so much beyond the design part that I hope as you guys are fashion designers that you get into that and get experience with that as well. So that's definitely practical advice. So let's <laughs> listen to these guys. Um, let's talk about then on the flip side, can you talk about a recent moment of like, triumph is a very strong word, but like a moment where you're like, oh my God, this is so great. This is so cool that so-and-so is wearing this or this happened, or this new retailer might have just signed on. Mm -hmm. Like, What's like y the most recent happy moment from your, we all need more happy moments right now, am I right? So <laughs> like, let's talk about like a recent happy moment. Um, I think one of our most recent happy moments was Bergdorf's posted a couple posts about the collection. And usually I know that like without us spurring it and it just came out of nowhere and they've been awesome. And that's one of my dream stores of life. And I don't know, there was something super cool about that. but. Probably the happiest moment that's ever happened on Instagram was I was doing the Vogue Fashion Fund application. I was 1 a.m. in the studio about to submit it the next day, and my team wanted to kill me. Like, we were all writing on the wall, like, what is this brand? And um, Michelle Obama wore a dress for the first time, and it came up Casual, on Instagram. Casual, no big deal. But that was cool. Like, that was crazy to see it for the first time on Instagram. And it's funny because it feels like, it felt like a really personal moment, even though it happened on and so what was your reaction um, when you we saw that Instagram? Like, Did you like oh, freaking out? I called my mom and I was like, what's Instagram? I'm like, oh my God, you don't even understand. <laughs> um, but no, it was, it was so, so cool. And those things, like, I feel like when you get tagged in things and you see people wearing it and things that are unexpected, that's what I love it for. It must be great when you look at like on Instagram photos of you when people tag your dresses yeah. or when people tag you know, things yeah, like Yeah, that's my favorite part is Me to too. like see how people take what we do and like the things that we make and make it their own and yeah. bring it into context as we could never imagine. Or like they've worn on like their wedding day and you're like, yeah. I don't even do bridal, but it's so cool to see that like you, you thought that. You should do bridal. <laughs> That'd be awesome. You heard it here first. Yeah. yeah. Me too. Just going to yeah. start that rumor that you she's doing bridal. You can do honeymoon. Bridal. I'll do yeah. bridal. That actually <laughs> totally. bridal. Yes. There's a power combo right here. I love that. What, what about it for you, Becca? Like a I recent say, happy like, moment? Yeah, there's definitely been high points. I mean, getting into the fashion fun was such a thrill and total craziness. Let's talk about, like, I want to hear about the, because uh, have you guys heard of the CFDA Vogue Fashion Fund? Okay, so you see, like, lots of nods. Talk about the process of, like, applying for that. Because I, I think people don't, re they, they watch the show, they watch the web series, but I don't think people realize how, how intense it is for, and for so long, right? 
For the first time I applied was before we got accepted. I, you have to apply to get an application. So I sent an email to the CFDA being like, I'm interested to apply for Chromat. And they wrote back and they were like, we looked at your stuff and no, we cannot not send you an application. No. I was like, dang. So then I applied the next year and I actually received an application and then I sent it in and then we were chosen to be in it. And that was crazy because I knew that there's so many levels to even get to the application process. But that, I mean, in a lot of ways, I felt like it was sort of like vetting. Like now I feel like I know, I, I don't know, I just, I didn't grow up around fashion people. I didn't know anyone from Vogue. I felt like I showed up to New York with zero connections. So now sort of even the fact that Vogue people know who we are is so beyond what I could have ever and imagined. And Kanye West knows who you are too. Talk to, talk, oh yeah, that was the highlight of my like, life. The she just said it was the highlight of her life. Yeah, yeah, and getting married, of course. Yeah, and, yeah. Um. <laughs> sorry wife, <laughs> sorry wife. She's literally like, what? Um, no, yeah. Tell us about that your was Kanye part of the encounter. CFDA Vogue I remember Fashion seeing Fund. That. Yeah, 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 so um, the CFDA Vogue Fashion Fund chooses 10 designers to compete for a prize. And one of the little challenges that they have is they fly us all to LA to do a fashion show there. And it's just so happened the host of the fashion show for the one that we did was Kanye and Kim. And I've been such a big fan They're called for Kim Ye when you refer to them yeah, together. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Duh. <laughs> and Kim was pregnant with Saint, what is now Saint. And um, those are, but anyway, I'm such a super fan that everyone, like all my designer friends that we did the process with, as soon as he like came into the, the runway show area, everyone's like, Becca, the eagle has landed. Like, he's here. <laughs> I was like hiding behind my friend, like sneaking a glance. And then I like worked up the courage to go over and talk to him. And I was very scared because, you know, people you look up to and you see in the media, you're never really sure if they're going to be like, I nice. just didn't want to get my hopes like dashed and, and see like some horrible side of someone that I admire so much. And, um, but it was actually the opposite. He was so curious. He was talk He was after the runway show. So he had seen our collection and one of our models who's walked for us many times since Lauren Wasser, she has a prosthetic leg and she was wearing a full like athletic outfit and he was super into it. He was like, I love that you had a model with prosthetics. I'm so into like cyborg um, implants and you know, kind of creating superhumans with these bionic attachments. And I was like, me too, I'm really into this. And he's like, that's why I got these implants in my mouth. And he was showing me his grill. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was really next level shit. And like, it was beyond what I could have ever imagined. He was like talking about, he's like, I'm so psyched right now. I just had a design meeting with like my whole team and we're doing lots of structured pieces and we got really into it. And then there came a point in the conversation where I felt like he was sort of testing me to be like, are you on my level? And he was like, I feel like we have mutual friends, right? And I was like, yeah, totally. We definitely have mutual <laughs> friends. And I tried to throw out some names. He's like, no, no, I don't know anyone. And I was like, fuck, that slipped away. But it was a moment in time that I'll never forget. It's a good moment, though. And that's a story that for like the rest of your life you should tell. Like, seriously, that's a good story. But I love that you mentioned, you know, that you often cast models you know, w with diversity, through the lens of diversity. And I know that's really important to you. And I see that on your Instagram frequently. Can you talk a little bit about your thought process behind that? Yeah, diversity has been so something we've done since the very start. It's something I really, really believe in. And now in the Trumpocalypse, it's something I believe in even more that it's so, so important to celebrate marginalized communities and whatever platform we have, whether it's on Instagram or anywhere to highlight and celebrate and center people of color, women of color, models dis with disabilities, like all these people that make our lives so amazing and inspire us, they should be the focal point and the center and like the highlight of, I just feel so, I don't know, I, I feel like I've been getting really political on Instagram lately, like, and I, I felt like I had to make a all decision. Us, yeah. Yeah. Because I was like, sorry? Yes. I just felt like, do I want to appeal to everyone or do I want to tell people how I really feel yeah. and like how I believe the world should be? And so that was something that I felt I just had to like put my like stamp down and be like, I believe in inclusivity and, you know, anyone who doesn't can unfollow me now, basically. And yeah. Tanya, I know, like, you know, you were very involved with Hillary, at, you know, as I think we all were. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, like your point of view on it as yeah, well? Yeah, I think we designed a Hillary Clinton t-shirt and at first when we did it, I was like, is this gonna be 
like how much should I talk about this? Like I 100% supported her and I believed in everything that she was running for and obviously attended a lot of things around the campaign. And it felt like, was that a personal thing or is that a company thing? And I just made it part of everything because I thought that it was so important that anyone who was following our brand saw that that was part of our ethos. And same thing, if you want to unfollow, then unfollow. And some people did. Like when we first posted it, I think we lost like 150 followers that day. And right. But I'm sure over time you gained it, more. Exactly, you know? exactly. Um, and it was worth it. And I think that it's really important... I know I'm supposed to be moderating, but I'm just going to throw in my two cents here. But I do feel like if you are fortunate enough to have a platform, whether that's 500 followers or 5,000 yeah. followers or 500,000 followers, I actually think it's like if you don't take a stand, that's worse. You know, Definitely. if you're lucky enough to have a platform and a voice, as everyone in this world has a voice, and whether or not we realize it, and hopefully it stays this way, like we are very fortunate to be a part of a democracy, and every voice should count for something. So... I think it's really important that people speak up. And the generation in this audience of students and who are the people who are going to change the world, like you guys in four years from now will be the ones who change the course of history. So please do that. Um, uh, please, uh, please, please. Um, so we actually have like a lot of questions rolling in. So I might actually um, like throw it over to the audience questions if that's okay, uh, just because I, I always feel bad in these panels if people, the audience has questions, we don't get to them. So, I mean, but they're all pretty relevant. So the first one is like, for you guys, do you do your own, the, the, we have a question that's, do you have help with your social media or do you guys do it yourselves? I do it myself. Um, I have help if someone's like, photo like photography, like mm -hmm. I'll, we'll get, you know, we'll take an intern and put her in clothes and have her run around Soho and someone else will take those photos. But um, I plan the whole thing myself. But you back up. I'd like to give a special shout out to Ben Ritter, our marketing director who's sitting in the front row. Is I think you should stand up. Ben. Yeah, let's give a round of applause let's for Ben Ritter. Let's give a round Ritter. of applause for this guy. <laughs> so our Instagram is very much a collaborative effort. We've had many social media interns. Mark, um, obviously, we have a marketing director. It's me too. And we all kind of throw ideas into a hat. And sometimes it's me Instagramming on the fly from Rio, where I was at last week, or... It's, it's always a group effort, like I'll do my part, but I think it's better when there's more opinions on the table. Great, okay. So uh, two people asked this question, where do you see wearable technology, smart textiles, et cetera, were fitting into the fashion industry? Um, and I know that for, I think it was, was it your year that there was a challenge with Intel or you did That's something? The year after. Or the year yeah, after, yeah. but you've, you've worked yeah. a lot with like, technology companies before. So maybe if you could start, Becca. I'm super into technology. I definitely see it as there's, I feel in fashion so much has been done and we're repeating a lot of trends, but technology is so super new and it's such a, a blank slate and a new horizon that that's something that I really feel excited about innovating in. And we've done many collaborations with Intel, Misfits, um, all kinds of electrical engineering teams and scientists and it's, it's really exciting. For us, the goal is to make garments that do work for the body and to make garments that can adapt and respond to either how you're feeling on the inside, the exterior, your context where you are, art. like what if you had a shirt that could go from sleeping in to being work appropriate to being tight at a party to being just like all these different use cases for technology to sort of integrate into garments. But right now there's a lot of barriers like battery packs are huge and not comfortable. And technology has been built by the tech world to serve these sort of hard surfaces. And, and when it's bridging into the fashion world, we need stretch, we need comfort, we need softness. And that's never been a goal of a lot of the hardware development in technology. So I see smart fabrics as really an exciting frontier. And 3D printing, I see body scanning and 3D... I mean, I could talk about this for hours, but... Body scanning and 3D printing is a way I feel that we could have more inclusive, um, you know, size inclusive garments where everyone has a scan, just like you have selfies on your phone. You can download the files, apply it to your scan so it fits perfectly, and then print it out at home. That's something I'm super into. That would be very important for bra shopping. Yeah, exactly. Like that yeah. would be like the holy grail. That's the first shopping. thing we ever 3D because printed. Because honestly, it's like in denim. Because denim, it's like. There's totally. some, like my, my best friend and I, same height, more or less the same weight. We're both pregnant right now too. But it's like, it was so funny. Like whenever we would go jeans shopping, it's literally like nothing looked, 
like the same on both of us bras too. So yeah. you, I think you should make that happen anyway. I think we're definitely less tech focused than Chromat is. But one thing that um, is interesting for us is I went to um, Google a couple months ago with the CFDA actually and one of the wearable tech conversations that were going on was about print. And if you think about someone who's buying a printed dress and them only being able to wear that dress a couple times because they don't want, they, it's recognizable. They're coming up with this really cool wearable tech where the dress could be totally solid and you could actually create your own artwork on your phone and it could reflect onto your garment. And Wait, when is this happening? I don't know. This was what we talked about when we were with different um, kind of test groups. But that totally interests me because I think that's a, ba that's a barrier for our brand is that it's, you know, prints are subjective and I think that, you know, the wearability of being able to wear something multiple times is really important to me and I think that's why I am, you know, we're positioned at like a more affordable price point to be able to attract a wider audience and I think there's something really cool about using tech so that your, your clothing is as versatile and malleable as your life is. That's the same kind of thread of full customization. Yeah. In the future everyone will be so unique and so totally customized. And it can change how often you want it to. So we have another question here where um, the questioner is wondering, what do you think the difference is between a clothing designer, clothing designed by a woman versus clothing designed by a man? That's a good question. Whoever asked that, it's like, good job. It's a I hard question. I'm glad I'm not answering it. I think there's a, I think there's a big difference. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think that in you know so many interviews I read that men design for fantasy and women design for functionality. There's an element of that that's real. I think we design for what our bodies want to feel and I think that there's this physical um, sense to what I design that it is, it's, it you can't be replaced by what, I, mean, I just, I personally don't think a guy can know what you know, proportions and what feels flattering and what fabrics feel good on the skin. And I think there's this kind of emotional touch that a female designer has. Yeah, I'm gonna echo that and just say that there should definitely be more women at the top, women who own companies, women who own luxury conglomerates, and that will definitely influence how many women you see designing your clothes. Right. So, um we had someone ask a question about Instagram versus printed magazines, but I'm going to kind of skew the question to ask you guys, how do you guys feel for an editorial mention versus like, do you differentiate between a social media mention versus an editorial mention? And how do they differ in your minds? Which, because frankly, they do. Yeah. I actually feel like, you know, Ben and I have talked about this. And it's like, if, you know, Beyonce is wearing it on tour or someone tags themselves in a picture, it's the same to us. It, it just ends up as one post on all our social media platforms. And I would say the quality of like the styling or the lighting or just like the, be the beauty of the image is probably more important than where it came from. Because when it gets down to social media, it sort of becomes all the same. And what stands out is like the art artistic direction, things like that. I think in terms of impact on sales and like um, definitely social media drives more sales for us than editorial mentions. I think a lot of people these days aren't, well, they're reading magazines, but they're not necessarily actively connecting how they're reading and how they're shopping, whereas on social media, it feels like it's always on the same device, and there's like that um, kind of more effortless conversion. So mm -hmm. social media definitely helps us. And, and now you can put links in your Instagram I stories, know. so. I saw that, I like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can click directly Last on the story week, right? into yeah. a website? Dude, yeah. <gasps> yeah. It's like schooling this entire audience of a few hundred people. Oh yeah. my god. I'll show you. Okay. Cool. It's basically, you're, you're, you're verified, yes? Wow. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Let's, let's, let's do this. We'll do okay. a little live tutorial. If you, oh my god. You know you can like upload from camera roll to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. You can do like multicolor text. All right. Okay. Sorry. We're just like. Doing I didn't a know mini. about the clickable link though. That yeah, was the cool. clickable. No, it's actually funny because I was uh, you looking can do at at your mentions. So yeah. later, if I like at mention you, 
I could, if I at mention Chromat and Tanya Taylor, like people can click from my story directly to oh, your profile. Cool. But you're that, so good at teaching that on your story. Yeah, like I you love like, your story because there's always tips. It's very educational. Like step. One. I just learned that if you hold the story down, you can pause the story. I like mention that once a week. Yeah, on it's story. great. I started my, reading yeah. like full length texts on it's your like Instagram. It's like PBS. It's like the P it's educate. It's like the Discovery Channel of fashion channels, I guess. It's so. great. I have a question for you. Do you I remember um, when I was trolling on your page one day and I noticed that you had a contact. This was before you released the, the contact and I actually clicked directly on it and started emailing you. Not planning to like email you that day, but I was like, oh my God, I can't believe there's a contact page. Do people reach out to you a lot via your contact uh, so page? That's an interesting story. So that was a bug. It was oh. actually um, before we officially released Contact. It was like, I, you might have been traveling somewhere or something, oh. and somehow you got to see it. And so you emailed me directly that day, and then like 14 people from Australia did, oh. asking me for like, where are your shoes from? What color is on your nails? And I was like, oh why God. am I getting all these, con like how are they getting my contact? And then I, yeah, it may have been, a, so slight funny. bug but yes uh, you can switch to a business profile now and now there's a contact button that says like and it's great if you're building a business like you know if for the florist who, you know who's building her business and wants people you can get give directions to your location you could put a phone number you could put an email address um, but yeah that that a lot of people do reach out to me if people ask me questions in comments I always like almost always respond mm -hmm. unless someone's asking me a question like why are you such a horrible human being <laughs> you know or like I remember one time someone was like do you think you're a hand model why do you always post pictures of your manicures and I'm like I'm not going to answer that question I want to skip that one um, but I do tend to respond to my followers just because I feel like sometimes like it, it's just like I like connecting with people and I also feel like like for I you know when you're traveling for instance it's a great source of like recommendations I was in Paris uh, a week ago and I just was really I just wanted to, like noodles I just wanted like delicious Japanese noodles and you I literally posted like hey guys looking for this like give me your recommendations and it got like 300 recommendations in like an hour and now I have this like list of Japanese noodle places and it makes me so happy so like you know that's one of the ways that people don't think to use Instagram but it's like that's one of the great things that it really is an international community it's 500 pe a million people around the world and like you guys definitely have followers in Paris and Milan and London and if they don't they'll tag a friend who lives there and they'll be like oh so and so might know so that's one of the great things about Instagram I think um, but okay, uh, so editorial versus we answered that question. And that I do think, like my personal perspective um, to the person who asked is like, I do think like printed, mag like I came from printed magazines. I love print magazines. I still subscribe to many of them. I feel like I look at them as like um, almost like a aspirational kind of or affirmation. So if someone, when someone's on the cover of Vogue or W, it's like a moment, right? And the kind of photography, like the Rihanna cover of W is like amazing. Like, and you saw it everywhere on Instagram and that allowed W to become a, to have a global moment for someone in, you know, Scotland or someone in Tokyo who might not be able to get a print copy of that they got to see it and kind of be a part of that moment so I do think there's kind of like um, different kind of it's a different funnel for creativity um, but in terms of like day to day like I know that most of my shopping inspiration comes from Instagram like I don't know if a lot of you guys follow Leandra Medine man repeller like anytime she wears something I'm like damn it now I want like jeans that give you like a wedgie and like you know <laughs> Like I want to wear like a bra over like my my jeans and like you know just wear like weird stuff that I could never pull off. But like you know it's like that kind of or the loafers I'm wearing right now these Gucci loafers. I swear to God, like I looked at these loafers for like six months on Instagram and finally like I kind of angrily bought them because it's like it took me like maybe not six months. It took me like three months to be like. I think I want them. I don't, I don't know. I think I want them. And then literally like went to the store and I was like, damn it. I want them. Like, damn you, Instagram. Like, oh, damn every blogger. And then like paid it for them. But like, 
love them so much. But it's like that kind of shopping inspiration I do think often starts from Instagram. And so many trends, like if you think about the brand Vetements, like it's like those jeans with like the butt pockets where you're literally like, these are the weirdest jeans. Who's paying $895 for them? And then I'm like, damn it. <laughs> like, no, no, I'm not gonna get those. Like I tried them on, they look terrible on me, but literally like I thought about it because I saw, I kept seeing it on Instagram and all the bloggers wearing them models wearing them. So I call it like the Instagram effect where sometimes like you see something long enough and you're like, gosh darn it. Like for me it was the Le Bonbon earrings. Like oh. those like circle ones. I feel like I saw them on Instagram all the time and I was like now and on Boomerang they were yes. moving. It's like they hypnotized you. You're like I need them. <laughs> yeah Boomerang is like sometimes you see something or like slow-mo on yeah. Instagram. If it's like someone's wearing something like fringy and they like twirl I'm like it's like, you know, it's literally like watching a cat in front of a washing machine. You're like, like just like watching it like go over and over. Like, you know, video on Instagram can be so like hypnotic. I totally. Think. Sorry, uh, we went on a little bit of a tangent. So hopefully that answers your question, whoever asked that question. Um, just go on these tangents. All right, so, um, is, okay, so someone asked about, um, Cur curation on Instagram. Um, is there a downfall to the over curated Instagram, uh, cur over curated images on Instagram, or versus you know beauty in the raw? So maybe like, how, like I know Tanya for instance. It's like I feel like following you on Instagram stories and seeing seeing like you hanging out with like Giovanna and like your your friend group and going like I feel like knowing you better as a person through your Instagram. So mm -hmm. I feel like you have a really good mix of like. Um, curated images on your, and, and then also there's a sense of like the joie de vivre that you, that spark of life that you have. Like, can you talk a little bit about your approach in that respect? Yeah, I, I just don't have any, I don't really have any limits to what I share on Instagram stories. I try not to put too much of like my husband or apartment. I put a lot of my cat. Is he shy? No, he just hates pictures and hates Instagram. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> He also feels like he's a bit of the Instagram husband, oh, and yeah. so he's like, oh, thanks for putting me on it. Like, I, I took the photos. But um, no, I think that I'm pretty personal. I think I, I wear my heart on my sleeve with design, with everything I do, so I, I bring that to the way that I approach Instagram. Um, Curation-wise, in terms of the actual page, I think I've, we've gotten a lot better at planning ahead with imagery, but it's always the really... Um, I always think it's the ones that are more emotionally, like I just see something, I take a picture and I post it, that Those do always do the best, right? Yeah, and yeah. you suggested a while ago to post flowers, and it's like, we do so many florals, and now every time I walk by a deli, I take a picture of a flower and post it, and those ones, like, somehow they resonate with people. They feel like they're, they were done in the moment. Nice. We see, we've seen a trend internally here, at, you know, at Instagram, where over curation of images actually tends not to do as well, whereas the more kind of authentic, like this is who I am, the more behind the scenes pictures, those tend to do better. And it's almost always mobile first, which means that if it's a photo taken on an iPhone, like for some reason those, at least from my personal experience and all the experience of like my friends and bloggers, et cetera, pictures taken on an iPhone or you know Android, whatever, tend to do better because it feels more like you're there with the person. And nowadays, like anyone with a DSLR camera, who has a really delicious avocado toast situation going on with maybe a cappuccino, a cappuccino with like a little maple leaf in it or some sort of art on it on a Carrera marble countertop like with the perfect pair of Fendi sunglasses and a DSLR, anyone can take that same photo. You could literally be a blogger with six million followers or you can be a student with a really, really, really patient boyfriend taking those photos of you crossing the street with that one strand of hair flicking across your face <laughs> and the coat hem flying out in the wind with the taxi cab in the background. You guys know what picture I'm talking oh about. Oh my God, you I, are reading people for their lives no, right I, now. I, I, live, I live like on the no NYU. No one is safe. No, I live on the NYU campus and I once saw a girl with like, she, her boyfriend need, like literally needs to get like a trophy. Like a, she, I saw her walk across the street like probably 15 times, the Washington Square Arch in the background, and she would like flip the hem at just the right moment, and he would be like tick, 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 on the cannon. And it's like, so what we're finding, and what I'm seeing with a lot of like, you know, the top accounts, like, you know, a lot of the models, and a lot of like, you know, the, 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 the bloggers, is that, and they always say the same thing to me. They're always like, 
the, the pictures that are taken on my iPhone always do better. It be, and I'm like, it's because people feel like they're there with you. And also, one of the things I always hear from designers is like, oh, I live in Paris and oh, the like Eiffel Tower, bleh, it's so boring. And I'm like, you have to remember that most of your followers don't live in Paris. And when they get to see the Eiffel Tower through your eyes, like you're taking them like on a journey with you. Um, I remember once a designer texted me and he was like, oh my God, emergency. And I'm like, oh my God, he's been hacked or like, you know, whatever. So like, he was like, I don't get it. I posted this picture of myself on the beach. It's, I'm not even in it. It's just like my toes in the water. Why did that get 3,000 more likes than like my campaign images? And I'm like, dude, are you seriously texting me at 3 a.m.? <laughs> with this urgent Instagram question. I thought like literally, cause you know, that's happened before, like Instagram emergencies. There's one designer whose Instagram got hacked 20 minutes before his show started during fashion week. And literally like I could hear this, the sweat was coming through the phone when he called me. It was like a river of sweat. We fixed it, don't worry. But like literally like, I was like, this is not an emergency. However, I will respond to you because I have insomnia and it's because people feel like they're on vacation with you and they're showing, you're showing them something they haven't seen. Because the ad campaign, they've seen on the side of like the bus stop, they've seen in Vogue, they've seen it everywhere. Whereas you on vacation, they feel like they're somewhere with you. So, um, oh my God, this is like a diatribe. I'm gonna stop talking right now. I'm so inspired by it right now. Oh, I'll just keep going, just kidding. Um, so whoever asked that question, like raw is better. Um, and like the cap like even the person who like I had a meeting with this person who was like I invented the cappuccino art picture like and this person literally was the first person to use to take a like literally the first person like four over four and a half years ago to take that cappuccino art picture and the person really really perfected it into an art firm I like how I'm saying the person so it's gender neutral so you won't know who it is but that person then said like I, I know I can't even post that picture anymore because so many people post it. And the pictures that do better for me are the ones where, you know, it's like very obvious that you're there with me somewhere. So I think that's just one thing to keep in mind. Um, anyway, are there more questions? Are there more like index cards or is this like the, 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 the end of it? Like, that's it, okay. Um, all right, so, um, what do you think about the FTC crackdown? Ooh, that sounds so like, you know, like official on sponsored posts enforcing bloggers, celebs to just to close ad, SP, et cetera. Well, how do you guys work with like bloggers or models or like gifting product? Do you do you, is that something you guys do? We gift product, but only to like friends. Like we don't we don't ever like sponsor models or anything to do Instagram posts. Um, it's definitely been something we've talked about though. Like it's interesting to see, would that get us a new audience? Would that, you know, resonate with a new customer or something? But we've just never, we haven't done it yet. Yeah, we haven't done it either. Yeah. Should we so do I it? So I can't really speak to that. <laughs> yeah, do you Should recommend? Do um, I mean, I think, I think my opinion on this matter is like, like 50 years ago, like Dior dressed models and movie stars. Nowadays, their brands are dressing bloggers, they're still dressing models, they have like, Charlize Theron is the face of like four different things. Um, I just think it's a different landscape and each of those people um, represents a different audience. So if a brand works with bloggers, models, and actors, they all reach a different audience in a different kind of part of the world. Um, so I, I don't think working with bloggers um, is a bad thing. I think, it, as, as you said, Tanya, it does convert for, a, you know, and people, it really does help to raise awareness. I think like Chiara Ferrani and like Leandra have launched many, many, many designers just by literally like wearing something. Um, but I think in terms of like the FTC crackdown, like listen, I think disclosing is really important. I think um, you don't wanna mislead your followers. And I do think like there were, there were I think several kind of instances uh, recently, or maybe not that recently, I know there's like a big Lord and Taylor incident where people were paid to wear things, but then didn't disclose it. So I do think you'll start seeing bloggers like kind of disclosing more, but I think they should, yeah. you know, because it um, there's a difference between like, you know, I've borrowed clothes before. It's like definitely a privilege to wear a dress that like you're like, that's that that's my child's college education. I will wear it for one night, then I'm gonna return it to you as soon as possible because like it's ner it makes me nervous just to like touch it. Um, but you know, if you're being paid to do something, like it, it should be mm -hmm. clear. 
in my personal opinion. I agree. So, um, all right, next question. Shoppable Instagram. I feel like we kind of covered this one, but um, Instagram is a new feature that allows users to purchase from the app. Do you see this being innovative and a way to reach consumers? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we launched it. No, I'm kidding. Um, it, it, it was launched you know, a few weeks ago. It's a very, very small group. Um, and basically, it's something that we're testing right now. I do think it's something that people are really, go really going to love, the ability to tap on a post. And then if I post these slippers, the, the shoes I'm wearing, and one of you guys angrily wants to buy them the way I angrily bought them, like, you know, to make it easier for you to do that without it being like in your face and feel like it's like, mm -hmm. you know, a huge kind of like sponsored post. I do think that's the top thing designers have been asking me for. I think maybe out of every meeting I meet, have with a designer, they ask me for this. So I think it's really exciting, but it's still very much in a test phase. So, um, so yeah. All right, sorry, I took that question. You guys just like sat there and like <laughs> nodded your heads. Um, all right, and the last question is like, where do you see the future of Instagram? That's like a really deep question. Um, <laughs> like, uh, where do we see the future period? I don't know, I mean, so like, this is such a deep question, like with everything going on in the world, it's like, where do I see the future? I don't know. I don't you wish we could vote online? Yeah, I wish that that's like, I wish, I kind of wish it were mandatory to vote. Oh, yeah, I feel like people should be forced to vote. No. Do you guys at Instagram sit down and are you like, these are the problems that I feel fashion people are feeling? Yes. And the developers are like, okay, this yes. is the timeline. Literally, like, anytime someone is like, this is, like, feedback, like, I literally share it with the, the product team immediately. That's, like, part of my job is to be the kind of, like, middle woman between the fashion industry, which is a huge part of Instagram, um, and, you know, the Instagram kind of tech team and the product team. So, you know, th one of the reasons why mentions were added to stories is because, like, so many people were like, oh, we love, like, tagging friends and we love tagging friends on Instagram, and especially fashion people. You know, it's all about the fashion squad, right? Like, people love posting squad pictures. So the ability to tag people was really important and mm -hmm. something that the fashion community was really excited about. Um, you know, shoppable Instagram is something that, like, for the year and a half that I've worked at Instagram, people have been asking for. Um, so it's a lot of like portrait and landscape, you know how you can yeah. do portrait and landscape photos. For me, it's like the feedback we kept hearing from fashion magazines especially is like, there's certain photographers that work for these print publications where they don't allow the print publications to crop their photos. So um, Annie Leibovitz, for instance, doesn't shoot in square mode. I don't know why, who, who like, you know, but she doesn't mm. um, because she's shooting on like a beautiful, fancy, camera she's not shooting those that girl crossing the street in Washington Square Park but anyway like so you know the ability for a Vanity Fair for instance to run a Leibovitz photo like you know as it was meant to be like I think was very valuable so um, we love feedback we love feedback from everyone though so it's like you know um, a lot of the time when I do these events people will come up to me afterwards or before and say oh my gosh like I love Instagram like my dream feature is x y and z and really it's like I always take a note of it and we always put it in like a feedback kind of mm -hmm. situation so that people can hear because you guys are the users. Um, it's 500 million of, of you guys. So knowing, hearing ways to improve, I think is really important. But um, are there any other questions from the audience? I think we probably have time for like yeah. one more. Um, the, does anyone want to raise their hand and ask any questions? Yes, yes, hi. What do you mean you've lost three accounts? <coughs> oh, you have to like start from scratch? No. That makes me so sad. Yeah. I feel. I feel like there are two representatives from Instagram sitting in the front row. Pardon me? There are two representatives from Instagram. If you can, you can pass your info, info on to them and they'll help you. 
But there is a way to retrieve, like basically if you have your email address, you should be able to retrieve that. And then one of the things you have to do, like you said your phone was stolen. Okay, one of these things that like no one does, these are a few things that no one does on Instagram. Let's turn this into like the last three minutes of this is like I'm just gonna scream Instagram advice at you guys, like shriek it angrily. You guys all have to turn on two-factor authentication. Do you guys know what that is? It's like basically go in settings, you have to enter your cell phone number. If someone steals your cell phone, like they will only be able to get into your Instagram account if they have your mobile phone number, your mobile phone, and your email and login. It's one of the things no one turns on and then I'm like, dude, you gotta turn on two-fac. It's like, it makes you like almost 99% unhackable unless someone steals your SIM card and your login. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, I'm trying to think of other Instagram things that, did someone just like shout something out? No, but yeah, everyone please turn on two-fac. Um, uh, and please don't post nipples, thank you. Uh, <laughs> other, other questions like, before we, I see one hand over there, yes. That's a good question for these guys. What do you think? I, yeah, I think that's a great question. We've been copied before and it always like, it stings. You're like, oh, did I show that too soon? But um, usually I won't show a print, print until the day of our show. Um, and then by that time we have it copyrighted, which is helpful. Um, but there's always, it, it's like, you don't want to be fearful and not live your life and not post things. So I feel like it's kind of a, I keep just, posting and sharing things and I if they're gonna copy you they're gonna copy you and they're probably gonna do it faster and cheaper and you can't yeah. avoid it yeah and there's like there's a store on 14th Street um, right next to this like the nail salon I go to and literally like they have the fake version of these loafers and it's like they're painfully <laughs> bad like literally it looks like it was like looks like my dog's like chew toy um, not in a good way and I do feel like in quality like no matter yeah. what price point like you're the same technically person. like advanced, I don't I know, are you yeah. advanced contemporary? Like <laughs> whether it's like a $400 dress or $4,000 dress, if someone's knocking it off for like $19, like there's a reason why it's $19. The <laughs> it's like you stand near a flame and totally. you spontaneously like combust, you know? It's just like, I, I do think, um, and that's a larger issue I think that 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 relates to the kind of production timeline mm -hmm. as well. Um, yeah. Do you ever buy your knockoffs? Do I ever buy my knockoffs? Um, no. I do. Do you? Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. <laughs> we have I've a full collection. I, I don't know, it's like a trophy case. That's cool. We think it's funny. I mean, it's happened so much that we've passed all the other emotions that have just gotten to delight yeah. and joy, thinking that, that more people are seeing our ideas. But um, sometimes I learn things. Like, you know, if they're producing it for $20, they're making it in a way that is sewn really efficiently. Like, you're not wasting extra seams. You're, I mean, obviously Probably the fabric is way worse, yeah. but sometimes I learn a little thing, like, you know, you turn this seam this way, and I don't know. It's, it's interesting to see how other people approach our ideas. At the Woolmark final night, a woman walked in on our knockoff, and I was standing there, and I was like, holy shit, and our whole team was like, wait a second, we were all taking pictures of her? She's like, what's going on? That's but a yeah, lot. No, I, I Instagram story it. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a good moment. All right, any last questions? Yes, one, two, two last questions, and then we must adjourn, yes. Front row. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of, I'm sure there's many designers and illustrators here and creative people. So I guess the number one question is, how do you get a lot of followers? <laughs> Ooh, uh, okay. So that's probably the top question that we get on Instagram, uh, you know, working at Instagram. And it's funny because people in the fashion community, especially, think of accruing followers as almost like an arms race, like everyone wants the most number of followers, right? What I would say, um, and this is advice I give to everyone from like the big brands to like the startups, 
is like focus on the followers you do have. Um, and if you show them love and you kind of build a really strong, engaged community, the rest will follow. So obviously, first of all, content is important. You have to post like you have to post every day. Sometimes like I'll have a designer or someone ask me like, I don't understand, my account's not growing. Well, when was the last time you posted? Six weeks ago, and it's like, or sometimes six months ago, it's like you have to feed the beast and put in like, you, it's work, you know, you have to like create beautiful content. You have to ha tag the people you mentioned using, so funny, fashion people do not like hashtags. Everyone is like, I met with a designer who was like, ugh, le hashtag, and I'm like, like hashtags are not bad. It's actually a great way to like also bring increased attention to your to your posts. So I have one friend who's a food blogger, and she grew I think eighty thousand followers in a year and a half, which is I very. And she was taking beautiful photos of food, but she was using hashtags really cleverly um, and built um, and really tapped into communities of people who really love bacon. I guess uh, <laughs> she, or she like posts like all comfort food. It's like you like gain weight just by looking at her delicious <laughs> feed. But basically it's like, so she was doing hashtags really cleverly and helped her kind of get recognized by a bacon loving community. So I think like t using hashtags effectively is really important. And also like finding joy in what you post, I think is really important. Um, posting more p frequently as well, I think is important because again, like I said, some people post every six weeks and they're like, oh, I'm not growing. And it's like, you have to post every day because if you think about the number of photos that are shared, it's like you want to be part of that conversation. So I would also add, like during Fashion Week is when we get the biggest jump in followers every time we have a runway show. So like events, I think, are really valuable. Yeah. There's a question there. Facebook? Um, yeah, that's one of the questions that a lot of international brands ask, especially where they want it to, they want to have, let's just say Uniqlo has Uniqlo Japan, Uniqlo US, but it all rolls up into a global um, Uniqlo. We get asked that frequently uh, enough that I have definitely passed that message on to the feedback team. Um, I, now that Instagram in captions, you can do translations. I think it's more, we're seeing more international brands care less about that because you know their their message can come across to a lot of different countries but it's something that we have definitely passed on to the product team um, it's just a matter of logistics and capability so um, if you will join me to thank our um, panel tonight thank you, thank you.